Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Career Evangelist podcast. Today, it's another exciting one uh, because we have a special guest, Jeremy Slate. Uh, he's been on this show before, so this is his second time on the show. Jeremy is the host of the Create Your Own Life podcast, and he studies highest performers. I know you guys want to know about how uh, the highest performers, how they do it. So I want to learn that too. Uh, Jeremy's podcast has been named one of the maybe number one podcast uh, to listen to by Inc. Magazine in 2019. And uh, Jeremy has been doing a lot of great things out there. He's into branding. He wrote a book, From Unremarkable to Extraordinary. I want to learn from Jeremy today. And I'm sure you guys will find this episode beneficial. Without further ado, I will bring in my guest. Hey, Jeremy, what's up? Hey, man. Um, I, I guess I didn't create too much trouble last time that you were willing to have me back. So so thanks, man. And uh, glad to be here and offer some value to your audience. No, it's awesome. It's awesome to have you back. And I, you know, I've been following your podcast. I see lots of great things that you and your team are doing out there. So great job, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely, man. I appreciate it. So some of my uh, listeners, they don't know you. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself to uh, my community so that they can know who Jeremy Slate is? Well, I, I like to consider myself a uh, podcasting OG. And for those people that don't know what that means, that isn't a course an original gangster. Um, I've been podcasting for about 10 years as a host. Oh, wow. uh, I've been an early adopter listener. I've been listening since around like 2008, 2009. So I've always like loved podcasting. And I've run a PR agency called Command Your Brand that actually books our clients on top podcasts since uh, 2016. And just trying to make a big impact out there, man. Help people play the game of life a lot better. Because I know the world out there can be a pretty darn scary place. So I try to talk about some of those things and, you know, give people what the game board looks like so they can play the game of life well. You know, that's my whole goal, man. If you know the barriers, you don't have to be afraid of them, but you can do some cool things. Awesome. So you study highest performers. Why is that important to you, Jeremy? You know, I... I think we can learn a lot by looking at the mistakes and also the the winnings of other people rather than kind of making those mistakes and, and learnings ourselves. You know, sure, there's some value in in learning having a mistake and, and learning why you're never going to make that one again. But I think there's a ton of value in, in knowing how people have been successful. So, for, for example, um, one of my favorite baseball players, he's retired now, but he played for the New York Yankees. His name was Nick Swisher. And uh, Nick Swisher was not drafted out of high school. And if you're a really good baseball player, usually drafted out of high school. He gets accepted to one school, which ends up being Ohio State. So he's a walk-on at Ohio State. He ends up earning a scholarship. He becomes a first-round pick of the Oakland Athletics. And after he's off of the Ohio State baseball team, um, they end up actually naming the field after him. But that was a guy that was undrafted out of high school, goes to become a first-round pick, and they name a baseball field after him. So I think there's a lot of value in saying, well, what did he do? What is he preparing with? What was he looking at? There's there's so much value in doing those things so that I can implement things like that myself. And, that, and that's what I'm really looking at when I'm saying, well, what do high performers do and, and what do they think? Oh, so uh, thank you for sharing that story. Uh, and that would be a good case of from unremarkable to extraordinary, in my opinion. He was not. I, I would, you know, I wouldn't say he was a, he was unremarkable. Like, like his dad was a professional baseball player, so he had that going for him. You know. <laughs> no, 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 no that, that's true. But I, but I guess the point is, like, I think we all like my my point is, I think, you know, maybe some of us have a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe our parents have more money or more opportunity, or maybe they don't. And I so I think we all have essentially the same skill sets and things like that but if the, if we focus on something we can go from being unremarkable to something truly extraordinary absolutely so your podcast was named number one uh to listen to uh by ink magazine in 2019 i want to check with you what do you think contributed to this recognition and how did it impact your podcast uh, growth well, I think part of it is, you know, you did do good works and people find out about it. So actually that was a um, um, one of the people recommending shows is actually a listener of my show, which recommended me to that list, which is really cool. But I think part of it is too, people have this misunderstanding about PR, like you just do good works and people find you. But I've always been kind of a, a PR hawk in a lot of ways. I've been somebody out there 
looking for opportunities, looking for what's needed and wanted. So I think when you're somebody consistently trying to get opportunities, like um, help a reporter out or, or Haro is an email list that I've always subscribed to. And it tells me when different sources are looking for people. I've you know written for industry journals and things like that. I think it's really important to be contributing in your industry and contributing in your niche. And that is actually how people find you. I think far too often people think, oh, he's just doing a really good job. We're going to recognize him. And sure, that can happen randomly. But at the same time, you have to be creating PR opportunities for yourself or public relations opportunities for yourself. And that increases your chances of having things like that happen. So, you know, often you get more media because you're somebody seeking media. That, that's been my experience. No, that's good. Uh, I like the fact that you mentioned PR. Uh, in my world, uh, I've been trying to study marketing. So there's PR, there's mm -hmm. marketing. In your experience, what is the right combination uh, to scale a company? And how do these elements work together you know, synergetically? Well, I think there's often a misunderstanding for people in that, right? Like they're like, you'll see certain people that they want everything to be marketing, right? And, and you know, even business schools sometimes will take public relations and stick it under the marketing umbrella. But I think if you want to be successful, there's kind of like, um, you know, it's kind of like a conveyor belt, I guess would be the easy way to describe it. You know, you go from point A to point B to point C. And when you're looking at it, public relations always comes first. Um, and people always have a misunderstanding of public relations. Public is actually a specialized term. It doesn't mean the public at a whole. A public is a certain type of audience, right? So your audience may be podcasters, it may be doctors, it may be dentists, it may be other business to business professionals, but your public is actually the group you're trying to communicate to and how you relate to them. So it's that know you, like you, and trust you factor. Mm -hmm. Marketing is the action of actually promoting something and getting out there. And it can be paid or unpaid. And then you have the, the thing that everybody wants and that's, and that's a sale. Right, a sale is somebody exchanging value, hopefully money. Right, you know we hope it's money uh, for uh, for your 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 product or service. And yeah. I tell people like when you're not making sales, you need to start at sales and work your way backwards. Okay, well, how does our marketing look? Are we doing good marketing programs? Is the technology ready? Are we using the right software? Okay, good, we are. We're using the right software, but our marketing is not converting. Well, that's because the people you're marketing to don't know you, like you, and trust you yet. Public relations always comes first of getting those people to trust you. You know, you know, who is this guy? What should I know about him? Or what should I know about their company? And I think another confusion within that, when people look at public relations, people don't consider that you have company public relations. You also have personal public relations, right? Like if you're a total jerk to people, well, that can hurt your company brand, right? And so these are things you always have to be considering, like how you deal with every single person is also the idea of what people get of your brand. So if you want to have a more successful marketing program, you need to figure out like, what does my market need to trust someone? Um, should I be speaking on the right stages? Should I be contributing in the right journals? Um, who are the people I should be having conversations with or be known by? These are things that you can then use to be more successful. Like to me, if you're not doing those things in sequence, it's why often people are doing what I like to call playing hungry, hungry hippos for leads, right? Like, like I need another lead, I need another lead, I need another lead. Well, if people trusted you and you were doing good marketing, which hopefully you are, then people want to make a decision with you and, make, and, and uh, a sale happens. No, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, depending on who you ask or whoever uh, or where you, uh, your source, there are a lot of information out there about podcast and podcast growth. Uh, you have been in this uh, business for over uh, 10 years, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, my question now is, how can entrepreneurs effectively leverage the maybe $1 billion podcast market so that they can use it to grow their brand? Well, I, th I think the first thing comes from having the right viewpoint on it. Because I think often everybody sees like Joe Rogan and shows like that, and they think the idea is, so you get a show, you get a big audience, you turn on the ads and baby, we're laying back and we're making money and we're just, we're bathing in it. It's great. And that's, that's not how it works for most people, right? The top 1% of the podcast market makes 99% of the revenue. Um, so when you look at podcasts, it has a, a different position in the market for most people. I tell people, um, which is funny enough, it's not how I did it. I got lucky. Um, you should have a business first and then have a podcast. Because you want you to use your podcast as this like 
really great networking vehicle to meet more people that could do you know joint ventures with you or want to work with you or, or bring you into the right areas to speak. Um, or it could be a way that you do affiliate deals and things like that. But your podcast should kind of be the front facing portion of the business you already have. Um, which, as I said, funny enough, is not how I did it. I started a podcast, got a ton of attention out of the gate, and lucky enough, hey, you know, I started a business after the fact. That's not how it is for most people. So you need to understand, like, how can I create trust and how can I connect with people in terms of having a podcast? I will say, though, um, there's platforms out there. Advertise Cast is one of my favorites that if you're looking to, you know, hey, I don't want to go on podcasts. I don't want to have a podcast, but I want to. Um, utilize the space to do great with advertising. Well, that's a really great way to do advertising. And I will tell you, if you're a brand that wants to do well with podcast, um, give podcasters, you know, either a free trial of your service or free products and have them do it as an affiliate deal. Like I know my show does really well with some of the affiliate products I like. Um, they're health products, pillows, all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, we even got a HEPA filter from one of our sponsors, which is kind of cool. So yeah. like, we get all these things we get to try and then I get to tell my audience about my experience with them. So instead of just an ad, it's also a recommendation. So I think as a brand, if you don't want to go on them as a guest or you don't want to have one as a host, you can also benefit from them in that way and connecting with, with podcasters. Now, in terms of getting the most out of it, if you want to have a show, I always tell people start with being a guest first because you're going to be a better host if you know what it's like to be a guest. And you're also going to get that experience under your belt because you you'll you'll understand like what's it like to be on the other side of a of the mic what kind of a good question do i need in order to 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 give a good response so if you can have those things you can be a better host i i will tell you it took me well it took me a lot longer because number one i didn't like being on video originally so my first <laughs> 500 episodes were audio only and um from there, then we started doing video and things like that. But yeah. my first 200 episodes, I had never been on anybody else's podcast. And once I started appearing on other shows, I actually found I got better as a host um, because number one, people started knowing me more because of other shows. But number two, I really understood what it's like to be on the other side of the mic. So I became better at my craft. So really, that's how a brand should be taking advantage of it. If you don't want to be a, uh, a guest or you don't want to be a, a host... I would look at affiliate products with podcasters that really align with your purpose because you can do really well. If you're looking to really be on shows, then I would say go on them as a guest first. Once you get some credibility and your feet under you and everything else, then I would look at hosting your own show. That that would be my uh, recommendation. No, that's good. I, I like the fact that you mentioned uh, being a guest, uh, and maybe that's something that I need to take and uh, you know implement in my own. Uh, show as well. Uh, I always welcome guests to this show, so I need to also go out there and be a guest. Uh, you should, man. Like, like it's it's. I will tell you, like, you you realize some things you don't realize, like when you're as a host when you've been a guest for a bit, because you're like, oh yeah, I get that. Like, you know what I mean? There's like some things. It's hard, hard to explain it, but once you've done it, you're like, I get it. <laughs> Now, you know, I know you have command your brand uh, and your agency. I've worked with your agency to get uh, guests on my show. And I know you talk a lot about branding. I want to hear. My, my wife tells me I also talk too much just in general. But anyway. <laughs> no, brand, branding is a big deal. I, I'm more fascinated about with branding these days so and that's why i i ask uh, my guest uh those that are specialized in branding to tell me a thing or two about branding and by the way i'm also writing about branding so um, oh cool then... oh maybe I'll, maybe i'll be be cited in the next book man that's exciting <laughs> um well I, I think when you're looking at branding i think the thing people don't consider is number one the importance of aesthetics right like something that communicates to someone in the right way visually and aesthetics is interesting too because aesthetics can have a sound quality to it it can have a visual quality to it and those things are really really important because i remember seeing people like back in the day doing these like god-awful terrible quote cards on their social media and being like you know it looked like somebody had made them in like microsoft paint or something like that and they're like why is nobody interacting with my post it's like because it's missing that aesthetic quality mm -hmm. but that aesthetic quality should also be consistent, right? When people recognize it, is it the same brand look and feel? Is it the same color pattern? Is it the same, you know, way of speaking? And I find that a lot of people um, 
funny enough, if you ask them, they don't have a brand standards manual. And that's we at Command Your Brand, we have a 65 page brand standards manual about what the brand thinks, what the brand looks like, what's it feel like, how is the logo used, um, what are the tenets we stand for. Um, and and um, interestingly enough, to expand ours, we actually used a really good uh, prompt set for Chat GPT. So it's a really great tool if you want help in writing your brand standards manual. But that's a really great thing to have in the same place because then across your organization, everybody's representing the brand the same way. And that's really what brand is. Was when people when people see it, they're like, "Oh, I perceive it to be this." But then you also want to consider when you're looking at your brand, you know, what sort of positioning are you trying to achieve? Um, there's a really great book. Um, you know, other than your book, when it comes out, they should definitely read it. Um, a really great book called "Positioning: The Battle for Your Mind." It's by by Al Reese and Jack Trout, mm -hmm. and it was written like I think in the '80s. But it's a really really good book. And it talks about the concept of brand positioning and what it is. But to just consider that positioning is you're grabbing something people are already familiar with and you're either comparing yourself for it or against it, right? Like, you know, Pepsi versus Coke or, you know, our company is the Uber of blank. Like you're grabbing something people are already familiar with so that you can take that familiarity and make yourself more quickly familiar with them. It can also, the positioning can also be used in the way of like, well, how does your brand feel? Like, does your brand say to me, you know, like, um, intelligent? Does it say to me, um, you know, more out there? Does it say to me more conservative? Is it more badass? Like, what is it? So when you look at positioning, it's like a really, really important thing to achieve. And you're constantly building that because you're thinking about, okay, well, if I'm creating opportunities for my brand, does this affect my positioning negatively or positively? Um, if I'm getting a media opportunity, does it affect my position negatively or positively? You know, if I take a position on this idea, well, how does that affect my company positioning? These are things you always have to be considering then when you really think about brand, um, especially when you have a CEO that's like the personal brand for a company, right? Because that person is kind of seen as the person representing that company. So how do people perceive that brand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's good. Thank you. So your book, From Unremarkable to Extraordinary, How to Ignite Your Passion to Go from Passive Observer to the creator of your own life. Can you tell us the takeaway from your book? So if I had to look at that, man, I'd have to say that success is available to all of us. And I will tell you, like, I hate self-help books. This isn't just another self-help book. I, you know, I, I don't believe you have to go look in the mirror 50 times and tell yourself you're successful. I believe you got to do a lot of stuff and probably screw up a lot to, to eventually be successful more, give yourself more chances to win. So I would tell people that the biggest thing that you can learn from this book and why you should read this book is success is about hard work consistently over time. Okay. And for some, they may get lucky and it may be sooner, right? Like, you know, you see some guys that it may be sooner. It may be other people where you look at somebody like uh, Harlan Sanders, the guy that started Kentucky Fried Chicken. It wasn't until he was like in his 60s. but. Yeah you're consistent. You create, you, you create your own opportunities. You look for opportunities. You don't wait for opportunities to come to you. And I think oftentimes to me, it's an opportunity to not be, I guess the top dog in a lot of ways. If you look at a lot of, um, you know, first round picks in, in, in uh, professional football or, you know, first overall picks, there's a high percentage of them that don't work out. Do you know why all their life they've been coddled? They've been told they're the best, sure. they're the prettiest, they're the most handsome, they can't do any wrong. So they've never had to work with any adversity. Adversity is an incredible thing to be able to create and learn and grow. And just like you know, a, a blacksmith's furnace, it forms you. So I think there's so much value in hard work and you know, it's okay if you fail as long as you treat that failure as a way to never fail again when you learn something from it. Oh, this is good, I, I like it, thank you. Um, you mentioned hard work, consistency, and don't wait for opportunity. Go for it. So that's you know we, we all we, we all have friends like that, right? They're like, oh, I'm just waiting for my day in the sun, man. It's just gonna happen at some point in time. And it's like, all right, well, you can keep waiting because that's like trying to win the lottery, right? right. But then again, then again, some people even, you even have to buy a ticket for the lottery, right? So you still have to take a chance. Um, you know, like you have to. You have to crack some eggs if you're going to make an omelet, man. That's how it works. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you came out with a new book, a, a new PR book. Uh, so can you tell us about that, uh, about your new book, uh, Jeremy? Yeah, well, it's it's actually, believe it or not, a lot what we've talked about today about podcasting and new media. I find that 
the direction we're going, you know, the legacy media, you know, television appointment viewing, like it's dying, man. Like it's going away. And I think the thing that's really exciting is podcasting. And when I say new media, I mean things like, you know, podcasting, YouTube, Rumble, other video platforms like that. It's becoming more attainable to the individual person like you and me than it ever has before. So what I'm really trying to help people do is understand how you have an opportunity to really grasp onto kind of the, the death of legacy media and the birth of the new and understand like how you actually do that. Like, how do you, you know, build a podcast campaign? How do you look at the right shows? How do you communicate? How do you promote it? Right. Because I think when people look at a media appearance, they think, all right, I've been on my show or I've been in this newspaper. I'm going to kind of sit back and uh, and wait for my leads here. And, you know, what it actually is, is great. There's two parts to every media appearance. There's actually going on it and there's what you do with it. Right. Like, how do you update your branding? How do you use that to create marketing materials? How do you use that to then retarget that audience? So that's what I'm really looking at. I want to empower people to take advantage of the birth of this brand new medium, which is, you know, podcasting and new media. And uh, that's what we're trying to do in, in my new book, which is command your brand, grow your impact, income and influence in a new media landscape. Oh, awesome. So uh, I know you want to uh, empower people uh, with your new book. Tell us how you empower people with um, your agency, command your brand. Yeah. So if they want to grab that book, it's over at bestpodcastbook.com. And we're actually doing it, um, just cover the shipping and we'll get it out to you for free. So it's super low cost at the moment. And then how we help people at Command Your Brand is number one, we're an education company first. So we're helping people to understand like how do they take advantage of new media. But number two, um, we have two parts to what we do. We actually produce people's podcasts and help them get visibility on YouTube. And then we also uh, book our clients on great podcasts. That's what we're really trying to help people do is take the most advantage of this new media and podcast space, because I think there is so much opportunity out there. And which is funny because I feel people talking about like, oh, we're all going to die. And, you know, the economy is crashing and things aren't doing well. But, dude, there is more opportunity now than there has ever been before. You just got to know the right place to look and the right way to look. And that's what we're trying to help people do. Uh, I love positive energy. That's what I'm all about. Uh, you, you said opportunity is available for everyone. Success is there. We can all go out there and get that success. Now, why is it that some people, they still, you know, fall back uh, in the race of life? They are not grabbing this opportunity. They are not going out there to create their own life. What is it that they are missing? You know, I think there's a couple things they're missing. I think, you know, number one, and I think this is something a lot of people do. Number one, they're they're too afraid to hurt other people's feelings or too afraid to, um, you know, do things by other people's rules. So because of that, they don't often take risks. I think we make decisions for how they're going to make other people feel rather than, you know, what's the greatest good for the greatest number of people and how are we going to feel about it? And I think that's really how you should weigh your decisions. I think number two, like people are just spectators in life too much, man. You've yeah. got to get in motion. You've got to take action. You've got to do things. And, you got to be okay to fail. Like, because if you're okay to fail, then you're okay to learn something. So to me, I, I would say that's what it is. People are worried about pleasing others way too much. You know, don't live your life for people that won't die for you. Like that's something you should consider. And also like, you know, don't be afraid to make some mistakes, man. Like there is beauty in those mistakes and growth in those mistakes. Awesome. I like that. As we are about to wrap uh, this episode, Jeremy, um, I want to, uh, learn from you um, in terms of podcast growth what are some tips uh, that help you uh, to grow your podcast well I would say what I talk about in 2014 is very different than what I talk about in 2024 um, if you are not doing video if you are not on YouTube if you're not on Rumble if you're not on Odyssey and all some of these platforms you are hurting yourself like podcasting is very rapidly, and it's because the cost has gone come down a lot for what it is to produce a video show and a quality video show. If you are not producing a video podcast in 2024, you are shooting yourself in the foot. So I would say that is the number one thing. And that does not mean that you have to have a production crew and do all these things. Like, you know, I, I in my courses and my content, I'm teaching people how to use different AI softwares to do this thing on the cheap and make it look really, really good. So if you're not 
you know, utilizing the latest technology and you're not on YouTube or, or a lot of those areas, you're hurting yourself because YouTube it, uh, especially is the world's number two search platform after Google. So you're giving people a place to find your content and a way to find your content that's a lot easier. So I would say that's the number one thing I would say to people about podcasting in 2024. So I know that most authors, they are also readers. Uh, what is one book that you recently read that um, really uh, appealed to you? Um, I read a lot. So my master's is in ancient history. I studied Roman emperors and like, you know, why they were worshipped as gods and stuff like that. So I'm always reading like weird and esoteric stuff. So I'm reading right now a really interesting book about historical cycles. Um, it's called The Fourth Turning. Um, and it talks about how kind of there's like these 20 to 30 uh, year cycles in history. And um, there's four of them. And then usually you kind of flip over and something new happens in the first one. So it's called the fourth turn. I, I read the old one. It was just called the fourth turning, which was written in the 90s. And it was kind of like, hey, is a fourth turning coming or blah, 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 blah. Have we reached the end of this economic cycle before there's a new one? The one I'm reading now is called the fourth turning is here. And it's about how we're kind of around 2025 to 2030. Uh, we're kind of at the end of an economic cycle. And now we're seeing kind of things flip over. And we're actually coming up to some really cool prosperity soon, in my opinion. Awesome. Finally, where can I audience find you and how can they uh, find your book, your new PR book? Yeah. So if they want to grab our book, Command Your Brand, as I mentioned right now, we're doing a free just pay for shipping offer. Um, if you want to go over to bestpodcastbook.com, it's going to be the best place to grab that. So that's bestpodcastbook.com. If they're interested in anything on the company side, our hub for absolutely everything is commandyourbrand.com. You can find the link to just about everything we do over there. So it's either bestpodcastbook.com or commandyourbrand.com. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for coming on the show. It's been a great conversation with you today. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. I, I really appreciate you having me back. Uh, like I said, it means I didn't cause too much of a ruckus last time to, to, to be invited back a second time. No, it's awesome. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Thank you.